Good evening from Manila, Philippines. Good morning in Austin, Texas, USA. Good afternoon in France, Paris, and to the rest of the participating countries, good day. Welcome to the first leg and launching of the Simone de Beauvoir webinar series. I am Gina Opiniano from the University of Santo Tomas, Manila. This project was conceived by yours truly in partnership with Marine Rouge of the Universities of Lille and Toulouse in recognition of the importance of uh, continuously exploring the philosophy, works, and contributions of Simone de Beauvoir, the great feminist philosopher and author. Um, just a side story, I met Marine a few years back, I think it was in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, as then, back then I was a struggling PhD student and was looking for scholars of Beauvoir, um, those who were also working on Beauvoir's works, because I was working on um, Simone de Beauvoir's um, existentialist feminism. But I have to admit that maybe among the Beauvoir scholars who are present here uh, right now, I'm the one who's the most neophyte, but I would be very glad to learn from these um, scholars. So that is how we started with uh, our communication. And I think intermittently since then, we got to keep in touch on our sharing on um, works and articles about Beauvoir. We exchanged insights and until now, uh, we still do. And it led us to a discussion of a project which we call the Beauvoir Webinar Project. So this project is also in collaboration with the Department of Philosophy, Faculty of Arts and Letters, University of Santo Tomas, headed by Associate Professor Dr. Jovito Carino. And this project is part of the 10th anniversary celebration of the USC Department of Philosophy, one of the country's center of excellence in philosophy. And on that note, uh, to formally start the program, may I call on the chairperson of the USD Department of Philosophy for his message of welcome, Dr. Jovito Carino. We welcome everyone to the Simone de Beauvoir webinar series organized by the USD Department of Philosophy through the agency of our lead person, Dr. Gina Opiniano. Aside from being one of the highlights of a year-long commemoration of the department's 10th anniversary, we consider the mounting of this webinar as an important step, not just to promote here in the Philippines, greater interest on Simone de Beauvoir's philosophic legacy, but also to cultivate a more lively public discourse on gender equality, women's issues, and feminist intellectual thought. We are fortunate then to have with us scholars on de Beauvoir who can help us navigate our way through these important themes. The department is sincerely grateful for their presence and participation. So in behalf of the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Letters, Professor Marilu R. Madruño, we are once more extending our felicitations to the participants, lecturers, and organizers of the Simone de Beauvoir webinar series. Simone de Beauvoir was born in Paris on June 9, 1908, into a bourgeois family that was ruined in the aftermath of the First World War. She was a very good student who discovered the literary culture from her father, whom she admired for his intelligence. She learned the Catholic faith from her mother and at the Cour de Ciel, a very Catholic institution where she was trained until the baccalaureate. However, Beauvoir lost her religious faith at the age of 14. She recounts this in the first volume of her memoirs, Memoirs of Dutiful Daughter. She had a sister, Hélène de Beauvoir, who was born two years after her 
and who will be recognized painter, but whose legacy has yet to be measured. Because the family went bankrupt and found itself ruined, Simone and her sister had to study to find a job, their father being unable to provide a dowry for a marriage. For them, this was the path to freedom. After her baccalaureate, she decided to specialize in philosophy and started taking courses at the Sorbonne. While preparing for the Agregation, which was a very competitive teaching examination in France, she met a circle of friends from the École Nationale Supérieure, and in this group was Jean-Paul Sartre. In 1929, Beauvoir was received second after Sartre, who was trying the competition for the second time. That same year also saw the famous pact between the two. Then Beauvoir had to teach, first in the provinces, before returning to Paris in 1936. She recounts this period in Prime of Life, the second volume of her memoirs. She remained alone in Paris. Her friends left and Sartre was taken prisoner at the beginning of the war. She worked. She wrote her first novel, which was published in 1944. She came to stay. She then entered her life as a public writer of novels and philosophical studies. In 1949, The Second Sex, her most famous essay, was published. In 1954, Beauvoir obtained the Goncourt Prize for her novel The Mandarins. She multiplied her travels to visit or to give lectures with Sartre. She committed herself against the Algerian war, notably with the case of Bupacha, a young Algerian girl who was tortured. Then in 1958, she began a decade of autobiographical writing. At the beginning of the 70s, she joined and supported the second wave feminism movement and in 1986 Beauvoir left this world and as Elizabeth Badinter wrote women you owe her everything certainly women owe a lot to Beauvoir and while many significant contributions from Philosophers, feminists, and authors came after or have even sur surpassed her. Beauvoir's contributions to the world will continue to remain a legacy. So that's a very short um, um, presentation of who Simone de Beauvoir is. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more, more to share about Beauvoir, and uh, I invite you uh, participants to listen to our special guests and speakers as they share about these legacies of Beauvoir. Uh, there are two portions for today's program. First is the discussion on the relevance of Beauvoir scholarship and uh, to be followed by the presentation and con conversation and reaction of our guests on Beauvoir and her readers. Before I introduce our guests for today, I'd like to request the participants to share in the chat box their maybe hello greeting in their own language so we can share you know we can share each other's greetings in our own language so i encourage our my fellow filipinos to greet our participants from the us from from canada and claudia you're in canada right yeah from from europe and the other parts of the globe welcome and thank you for being here Okay, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, our guests for today. Our first guest is an associate professor of French literature. I am taking this introduction as a challenge to my very, very elementary French language knowledge. But well, let me try. <clears throat> so, She's an associate professor of French literature at the University of Ottawa, Canada. She's the author of a book 
l'adolescent dans la foule, Aragon, Nizan Sart, published by the Press de l'Université de Montréal in 2018. Her articles have been published in Etude Satya, Revue uh, des Sciences Humaines, Etude Francais, and Etude Littéraire. She is the assistant editor of Simone de Beauvoir Studies, a peer-reviewed multidisciplinary journal dedicated to advancing scholarship on themes relevant to Beauvoir's legacy, such as gender and sexuality, race and culture, feminism, existentialism, literature, and political activism. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Claudia Bouillon. Hello, Claude. Merci. Bonjour, Jenna. Merci. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, let my colleague Jennifer McWhinney speak first as we uh, organized our talk together. So uh, I will let her speak first. All right. On that note, our second special guest is an associate professor of, professor of philosophy at Worcester Polytechnic uh, Institute, Massachusetts, USA. She's co-editor of two books, Speaking Face-to-Face, -face, The Visionary Philosophy of Maria Lugon, State uh, University of New York Press, 2019, and Asian and Feminist Philosophies in, uh, in Dialogue, Liberating Traditions, published by Columbia University Press in 2014. Her articles have appeared in Hyphasia, Continental Philosophy, Chasme International, among other venues. She is a recipient of the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Award 2019 to 2020 and the Editor-in-Chief of no less than the Simone de Beauvoir Studies. Let us all welcome Dr. Jennifer McQueen. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Claudia and I are delighted to be here and I want to give a special and heartfelt thanks to Gina Piniano um, for conceiving of this wonderful idea and for Gina and Maureen Rouge for organizing this seminar and also for the, to the University of Santo Tomas for, um, for all of the support in this series. Uh, I think this is a fantastic idea and it is wonderful to see the, um, the next generation of Beauvoir scholars thriving um, globally and internationally. And I also want to thank um, Maureen and Judith, uh, the speakers today, very much looking forward to, to hearing all that you have to say about exciting new developments in Beauvoir studies. Um, we are in the middle of a Beauvoirian renaissance right now. Um, in the year 2020, we are in the middle of a Beauvoirian renaissance. And so I'll ask you a question, I won't answer it. Claudia might have some suggestions, but is Beauvoir's thinking more relevant today than it ever has been? And perhaps is our existential condition becoming more and more acute um, as we move into the 21st century? So I'll just leave you with those few questions, thinking about the relevance of Beauvoir. But in 2020, we just had last week uh, a new novel that Beauvoir wrote, Les Inseparables, that was published. We have unpublished texts of Beauvoir's that are, that are coming out um, on a regular basis. We have two huge scholarly editions um, that have just recently appeared in France. The, Playad edition of Beauvoir's memoirs, edited by Jean-Louis Janel and Eliane Lecantabon. And in the um, United States, we have the Beauvoir series, seven volumes, which have brought many of Beauvoir's works into, into English translation, edited by Margaret A. Simons uh, and many others as well. Um, I counted, I haven't gotten an exact count, but in the last year, we've had more than 20, perhaps 25 monographs specifically on Beauvoir published. And um, we've also had last year before COVID, seven international conferences 
uh, devoted to Beauvoir and to the 70th anniversary of the second sex and, and a number of special issue uh, journal editions devoted to Beauvoir as well. So again, we are truly in a Beauvoirian renaissance. I, before Claudia talks to you a little bit more about this relevance of Beauvoir in the 21st century and in the 2020s in particular, um, I wanted to say a few um, words about the Simone de Beauvoir Studies Journal because it's been recently relaunched within the last year. Um, currently, it's housed at the it's. It's housed at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts at the Humanities and Arts Department. And this is the journal of the International Simone de Beauvoir Society. So this is the publication of the society. We have seven editorial team members who hail from five different countries and multiple disciplines. Um, and we have a 32 member editorial board which last I checked, I think this hails from 12 different countries. So we're truly an international journal. The journal was first founded in 1983. And I want to, I'm not sure if this will work, but here is the very first copy of the journal, uh, volume one, number one. And uh, you can see the, the format of that. Um, and then through the years, there have been some design changes. So by volume 10 in 1993, uh, this was a special issue on Simone de Beauvoir and women writers. We can see um, um, what that looks like. Volume 16 took on yet a new format uh, still. Um, this is about moving into new century. Here's volume 27 in 2010. And then um, in 2013, the editor-in-chief of Simone de Beauvoir Studies for more than 30 years, Yolanda Patterson, retired. And there was a hiatus and a transition period thinking about how do we respond to this huge demand around the world for Beauvoir scholarship and interest in Beauvoir with a new incarnation of the journal. And so last December, the first issue of the relaunched Simone de Beauvoir Studies was published. Uh, you can see with a sketch done by Giacometti in Beauvoir's Friend in 1946, um, table of contents on the back. And then recently published uh, the second issue of the relaunch as well. Um, Simone de Beauvoir Studies is an incredibly distinctive journal um, for four reasons, and I just want to tell you about those. Um, first, it's a bilingual journal, so we welcome all submissions in English and French. Um, second, it's a multidisciplinary journal and an interdisciplinary journal, so we welcome submissions from people from all disciplinary backgrounds and also creative disciplinary juxtapositions as well. Um, third, we're also a multi-genre journal. Just like Beauvoir wrote in many different genres, we accept anything from academic essays to creative stories, creative writing, fiction, journalistic accounts, eyewitness testimonies from activists, feminist activist struggles around the world, um, memoir, autobiography, so we accept all genres. Um, and lastly, we are a truly international journal and we're working very hard to even expand our already robust international profile. So just to give you a little teaser, our next, our third issue of the relaunch will be published next month in November. We're sending it to the Tyke Center right now. It's an incredibly exciting issue and I can say out of nine authors, in that featured in our next issue, they hail from eight different countries around the world. So that's how international um, this journal is. And we accept any work that is in conversation with Beauvoir's uh, legacy. So, you, so uh, authors don't need to, to write specifically about Beauvoir's texts and ideas 
as long as they can make a case that their topics and themes and ideas are in conversation with her legacy or exemplify characteristics of her thinking and her writing. Um, so uh, the other thing that's unique about us is we're a hybrid journal. So we publish, as I showed you, in both print and electronic forms. This gives authors very high visibility um, and we're working very hard to expand all of our reaches and indexes and databases. So if you publish in Simone de Beauvoir's studies, we want you to be read. Um, uh, inspired by Gina's uh, poll at the beginning, I'm wondering if, um, if you are an author who has published in Simone de Beauvoir studies over the last um, uh, 40 years, would you please write that in the chat? I have published. I was going to list a bunch of author, famous authors who have published, but I see many of them are on this call already. So if you can just put in the chat, I'm someone who has published before in Simone de Beauvoir studies, that will give other people an idea. Now I just want to wrap up with um, saying that as part of the relaunch, we have inaugurated three uh, special awards or uh, 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 aspects of recognition that I want to mention here. The first is the Patterson Prize named after our uh, beloved and, and longtime editor-in-chief and founding editor of the journal, Yolanda Patterson. And the first, uh, the first um, Patterson Prize competition essays are due March 1st of next year, 2021, um, in English or French. And um, these are for any scholar who has not yet pu published a monograph is eligible to submit to this competition. Um, the, second, the second honor that we offer is the, called the Featured Translation. Um, and this is where we, we this, is, this is usually for very established scholars in the field. And we find an article that um, maybe hasn't received its due, is incredibly important, but has not yet been read on an international scale and we translate it into either French or English and republish it to give it um, the recognition that it deserves. Um, so, and then the third uh, opportunity is every year we have an issue that is guest edited. So you can propose um, a special issue. If you have a theme that you think is really important to Beauvoir studies, you can propose a special issue and um, if selected, you will then edit a, an issue on that theme. And that deadline is coming up fairly quickly. It's uh, November 15th, so about a month from now, proposals are due. Um, and I'll just say, we have a Facebook page, we have Twitter, um, and we have our website as well for the journal. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with me or Claudia or any other member of the editorial team if you have questions. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Claudia to talk a bit more about the relevance of Beauvoir studies. Merci, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, so a polyamorous trio of intellectuals explore the limits of their freedom up to the point where angst and jealousy take over. A famous psychanalyst in the midst of a middle age crisis observes her group of friends dissolve as a civil war is slowly overcame while trying to sustain a long distance relationship. A successful woman leading an advertisement business juggles with her family, her job and her lover while struggling with anorexia in a technocratic world driven by hyper performance and appearances. One would think that I am reading the abstracts of new exciting Netflix shows, but you recognize the outlines of some of Beauvoir's novels. This is how relevant she is now, maybe even more than ever, when, even when she was first published. The other night, I emulated Judith Coffin and Marine Rouge and began an inquiry into her current readership's reactions on Goodreads. Beauvoir has long left us, but her readers remain eager to recount how they discovered her literary works and what impact it had on them. 
having read Marine's excellent article recently published in Simone de Beauvoir's studies, I was struck by the parallels between today's readers' testimonies and that of Beauvoir contemporaries. Quote, I took this book to Paris and read it there. I went to the bars and cafes and read it there. I went on a date and horrible honeymoon and still have the book, but the husband, no. Is the, most likely li uh, is the most light comment of a Mandarin's reader. Another reader of the same book writes in 2014, and I quote her fully, I enjoyed every page. Reading it to me was an enriching journey. The post-war intellectual struggle to survive and make a difference was enlightening. I couldn't avoid comparing that to the state of the Egyptian resistance and the euphoria we lived in February 2011 and all the helplessness we felt in afterwards. I know a lot of differences lie in between. However, the slight similarities touched my heart. Like so many other readers, Karen, and those are not easy people to deal with, celebrated Les Belles Images for the way it speaks to her own present. I quote her. Published in 1966, this book is thoroughly modern and the protagonist so totally relatable with her anxiety, despair, rage, and ennui. It was surprisingly easy to read and I enjoyed it immensely. Another reader of her final novel kind of agrees with me about the potential of Beauvoir as a lucrative Netflix scriptwriter. She said, essentially the Beauvoir <laughs> anticipating Mad Men with ad artist protagonists. I could go on and on as it is absolutely fascinating to discover these comments with Marine's analysis in mind. In my view, the relevance of Beauvoir scholarship could not be emphasized more. As the assistant editor of Simone de Beauvoir Studies, I would love to see more scholars from 2020 and on ponder over her writing, specifically her literary works, which were deemed boring for too long, way too long and examine how it speaks to today's worldviews and real everyday life ethical challenges. Polyamorous relationships, body image, redefined masculinities, mental health, ethics of care, work-life balance, and so on. Those are all today's buzz buzzwords, but could be probed from the theoretical standpoint of Beauvoir's works. And this is what we are in for at Simone de Beauvoir Studies. We strongly believe that Beauvoir is a voice that needs to be heard more and more, that her works call for an ever new scrutiny and for a sustained dialogue. At Simone de Beauvoir Studies, we are not only aiming to publish articles on her writing, but also on its living legacy. Amongst other exciting topics, our journal has featured articles on the recently resurging concept of sorority, feminist ethics, black female presence in Beauvoir's novels, and so on. So who of you is going to submit to Simone de Beauvoir studies an article on authority in the police, ecofeminism, city governance, ethics of risk, or any other subject for which Beauvoir's thought can represent appropriate lenses? Thank you. And, and I'll just wrap up with uh, Claudia's invitation, who among you is going to submit. Um, you can find all of the information about how to submit an article on our website, um, which I think has been in the chat, but is uh, www.brill.com slash SDBS and all the information about the prizes. And I also wanted to mention if you're interested in reading all of the outstanding content that's recently been featured in the journal and all of the archives as well. To get a subscription to Simone de Beauvoir Studies, the easiest way is to become a member of the International Simone de Beauvoir, Stud Simone de Beauvoir Society. All members receive a, a free subscription to Simone de Beauvoir Studies. And um, we have student rates for membership as well. Um, and you could also get an institutional subscription through your university library. Um, and finally, we also offer a lot of free access content. Usually each issue has some free access content and we're launching an initiative this week to offer 25 uh, free access articles throughout the ages uh, for the duration of the pandemic as well. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you and to hear all of the exciting directions that you are headed with taking Beauvoir studies into this century and beyond. 
Thank you, Dr. Jennifer and Dr. Claudia. Wow, that got me even more excited to write more about about Beauvoir. And thank you for introducing the journal uh, to a wider audience. Um, it's interesting how the visual, how the journal, hard copy of the journal, looks from the beginning until its current issue. So it's it has evolved into in, in aesthetically, I must say. But of course, these are classics. So thank you very much. I I, I think we now uh, uh, um, have questions from the participants. But thank you, Claudia, for responding to the questions. There are questions about how to purchase or how to get a copy of the journal, and you can find um, response or answers to this uh, via the, as you said, your um, your what you call that website. Yeah. Okay. From the audience, I hope uh, I, I please share them in the chat box. So for comments or questions, and uh, we hope to to have time to um, read all of them. If not, uh, Jennifer and Claudia may want to just check the chat box for um, the comments. So thank you. Dr. Jennifer mentioned about the International Simone de Beauvoir Society, and uh, we would like to acknowledge um, the president of the International Simone de Beauvoir Study uh, Society, Professor Crescent Mascon. Hello, good morning. <laughs> I'm barely dressed this morning, but I did. Hello, I'm Crescent Molly Mason, the president of the International Simone de Beauvoir Society. And I'm just so excited um, for this webinar and, and all of the beautiful dialogue that we're having around Simone de Beauvoir. And like to thank you um, so much, Marie. And also thank you so much, Gina, for putting this together. And I'm looking forward to the continued dialogue that we have in the future. Yeah, we look forward to having you in the next sessions of the webinar. We'll talk more about that. Not We do not want to preempt the, the announcement, but definitely what we have, um, We'll have a collaboration with the International Simone de Beauvoir Society, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Crescent. So to continue with the discussion, uh, let me introduce the speakers for today. So our speaker, uh, first speaker is a PhD candidate in contemporary history at the Universities of Toulouse and Lille in uh, France and a teaching assistant uh, at the University of Toulouse. Her research is about the question of influence of Simone de Beauvoir and concentrates on the thousands of letters Beauvoir received from her readers. She has published articles in academic journals, women and gender history, and more specifically about Simone de Beauvoir and uh, um, her interest. Her very last article was published last month in Simone de Beauvoir Studies, uh, influence between uh, and is a study with, in which she proposes the hypothesis of a mutual or reciprocal influence between Beauvoir and her female readers. She runs a collaborative research blog about Beauvoir and you can write her if you want to publish a text in it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the communications co communication coordinator of the International Simone de Beauvoir Society, uh, my dear friend Marine Rouge. Thank you, Gina. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone. If I may, uh, Gina was very modest earlier and uh, you cannot imagine how hard she worked uh, for this to happen. So thank you very much, Gina, for, for everything. Um, Perry, to share your screen, yeah. uh, allow me to introduce the other special guest for, for today. Um, this. Our guest taught at Harvard and the University of California, Riverside, before coming to the University of Texas at Austin. She teaches modern European history, gender, sexuality, intimacy, and feminism, World, War, World Wars I and II, decolonization, and post-war Europe. Her first book was The Politics of Women's Work, The Paris Garment Trades in the 19th Century, and her sec uh, and her. Second book is 
um, a newly published book titled Sex, Love, and Letters, writing Simone de Beauvoir, which came out in September. She's interested in the history of work, social science, and political economy, but also consumerism and advertising, psychoanalysis, and the history of radio. She has written about many Grégoire radio broadcasts, intimacy, and interiority in cultural critics. She is starting to work on the story of O, fascinated by its relationship with the second sex and post-war conceptions of female sexuality, the erotic, and literature. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Judith Coffin. I'm sharing my screen now. Is it working? Okay. So um, before the conversation with Judy, I'll try to explain the, the topic that we are all gathered today to talk about, Beauvoir and the readers. Uh, until her death, uh, Simone de Beauvoir received thousands of letters each year, and every day she dedicated time to respond to them. And uh, among the letters written by friends, uh, intellectuals, and civil institutions, uh, there are those written by anonymous women, but also men, um, struggling, struggling in their daily lives and uh, seeking advice from um, the, the woman who became their, their confident players. Uh, we are lucky because um, because those letters are kept at the Département des Manuscrits, uh, Manuscript Department of the French National Library in Paris since 1995. Uh, that year, Sylvie Lebon de Beauvoir, who is the adopted daughter of Beauvoir, decided to give them generously to the National Library uh, so that they would be available to researchers. And the year after, uh, Yolanda Astarita Patterson, uh, from the Simone de Beauvoir Studies, as you know now, um, published the, the, the first article about the, the collection. So here's a glimpse at the organization of the collection. And I think uh, I've seen Guillaume Delaunay, who's the curator of the collection. He's with us today. So uh, thank you for being here. And uh, uh, feel free to speak up, uh, Guillaume, if you feel like it. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if Sylvie Le Bon de Beauvoir is here, but um, uh, we would not be here today if, he, if she had not uh, uh, gave the, the, the letters to the, the French National Library. So thank you, uh, Sylvie. So as you can see, there are uh, several units in the collection, lettres reçues, which means letters received. Um, the unit Judith and I are, have been working on, and we'll talk about this in a moment, is uh, the third one, lettre reçu de lecteur, which means uh, letters received from readers. Um, I, over the course of my research, I estimated that there are about 20,000 letters uh, in this unit alone. So um, it's a lot, and I'm going to try to um, very shortly to tell you the story of the collection and then the story of uh, the research that was inspired by those letters um, and which led to this beautiful study that Judith Coffin just published and also to some articles by um, other scholars. So it was from um, the late 40s that Simone de Beauvoir began to receive letters from her readership. Uh, when The Second Sex was published in 1949, she received thousand, uh, dozens sorry, of letters uh, mostly insults, as she wrote in her autobiography. But those letters are nowhere to be found. Perhaps Simone de Beauvoir um, destroyed them, or perhaps they were lost during her moves since she lived in hotels at the time. Uh, so the collection does not really begin to grow until December 1954, when she received the Prix Goncourt um, for her novel, The Mandarins. Um, and on the right, you have um, the image of Paris Match, a journal, uh, and I, I'm going to translate the title. Uh, it's Simone de Beauvoir was famous, and now she will be read. So um, from the Prix Goncourt, the letters take each year a little more amplitude in the collection. 
And uh, when she began to publish her memoirs in 1958, uh, women became the majority to write her because the genre of autobiography allows more proximity between the author or rather the narrator and the readers. And uh, women discovered a life in situation, which means that they were able to identify themselves to uh, and take Bovar's life as their guide. And throughout the 60s, which were, which were the scene of the radicalization of uh, feminist movements in France, Beauvoir received letters uh, from women exponentially, which shows uh, that Beauvoir was indeed a part of the dynamic that would uh, lead the feminist movement from, uh, of the 70s. Uh, of course, she also uh, received many letters about her political uh, commitment, uh, about the Russell Tribunal, for example, or about the Algerian war, for example, but we'll have the opportunity to talk about um, it again with Judith. And uh, as I said, uh, she received lots of letters until her death, and the fact that she preciously kept them shows that she had a very strong relationship with her readership. Um, and I think you could call this a real commitment uh, because indeed she responded to the vast majority and she had regular correspondence with many women. And uh, sometimes they would also meet each other. Um, so surprisingly, considering how rich this collection is, uh, of letters is, a uh, few studies have been conducted. Um, most of the time, the collection is consulted as part of another research. For example, um, Anne-Claire Ebriand, who's a French historian, conducted a study uh, on sexual practices and she consulted the collection, but along with other collections. Um, and uh, th there's also another French, a PhD candidate, who did a, case, a study case on the reception of the mandarins, for example. So before Judith Coffin's work, no one had considered this collection as a, as a whole to conduct a, a study, and no one had put those letters at the center of their research. And now there are at least three scholars who are working on them, to my knowledge, and I apologize uh, if, I'm, if I'm Mr. Kane, and uh, you can, of course, say it on the, on the chat box. The first one and is Alice kafai uh, who is attending this webinar, by the way. So hi, Alice, <laughs> in Australia. Um, Alice is a linguist, and uh, she has been reading the, the whole collection as part of a project on the, the impact of Bovar's language uh, on her readers. So she starts from the experience of her own mother, Claire Quiron, who's corresponded uh, with Beauvoir and whose letters are at the BNF. And she analyzes Beauvoir's impact on her mother's life, but also her mother's uh, writing trajectory uh, from the perspective of uh, systemic functional linguistics, which is a theory that considers language as a way uh, to act upon the world. Um, the, the second scholar is um, uh, myself, and I apologize that I'm taking the liberty of also mentioning my own work in this list because the PhD dissertation in history that I'm writing is based on those letters. Um, I, as Gina said it earlier, I study mainly the question of the influence of Beauvoir and of her works on ordinary women. Uh, and in this, it echoes Alice's research. Um, but it is well recognized that Beauvoir uh, has had an international impact uh, influence of, on both feminist movements and struggles for the emancipation of peoples. But uh, the idea that she, um, she, she has inspired thousands of women is regularly reflected in testimonials and uh, in discussions. But it is hard to uh, measure her impact outside the intellectual or, intellectual or public circles. So these anonymous uh, women's letters are um, precious documents to understand how and uh, when Simone de Beauvoir became this political and feminist figure we know today. And of course, the third scholar is the historian Judith Coffin, and in fact, she was the first academic to publish a historical article based on those letters in um, 2010. Uh, and I would also like to stress the fact that uh, it's precisely this paper um, that led me to work on those 
letters. And also my supervisor, Sylvie Chaperon, who's here today, uh, who told me about this collection of letters. So I have to thank Judith and Sylvie for this uh, beautiful discovery. <laughs> Uh, but to conclude this presentation and introduce at the same time uh, my conversation with Judy, I'll say a few words about this news book of hers, but I won't expand too much because we are going to have time to talk about this uh, during our conversation. So um, this book takes us from after World War II to the mid uh, 70s. Uh, it's a period commonly referred to as the Glorious 30. Um, Judith brings together two stories, in fact, uh, that had never been linked before in Bovarian studies. It's uh, the story of um, Bovar's work, of their impact in intellectual circles. She traces, for example, the vivid reception of the second sex. Um, and the other story is um, the story of the ordinary men and women who read Beauvoir and who were yet to be discovered. So the notion of intimacy is at the, at the heart of this study. Um, it is the intimacy that settles between a reader and a writer, uh, the intimacy that is imagined at the, at the time of reading, which is expressed in the letters to the writer, and which settles um, when a correspondence takes place between the reader and uh, Beauvoir. So in this way, the, the letters are the echoes of the period. Um, through these ordinary individuals, we are witnessing the intens intensification of ma mass culture, for example, the progressive liber liberalization sorry, of sexuality, the horrors of Algerian war, and the, um, the bursting of the feminist movement of the second wave. And uh, Judy finally plunges us into the intimacy of these individuals and succeeds in making a political, social, but also cultural history from below. So um, I will start our conversation by asking you a first question, Judith. Um, if, if it's fine with you, let's first talk of your discovery of this archive. And uh, maybe you could um, tell us how you managed to navigate into this huge collection. Because like I said, there are about 20,000 letters, so it, it's quite a, a challenge. Well, let me, let me start just by thanking everybody. This has been such a wonderful setup. Um, thank you to my co-panelists. Thank you, Gina, for that wonderful, uh, wonderful video. Jennifer and Claudia for um, it's you know for for the ways in which you're on top of this uh, renaissance in uh, in Beauvoir studies. Um, Marine, you have been wonderful ever since I've known you. Um, I've delighted to see all of these familiar faces, all these people whose uh, whose work I've uh, I've read. So this is uh, this is really a pleasure. I also feel like I'm plunged into a Beauvoirian ecosystem because the countries <laughs> represented here are a little bit the same countries that we see in this uh, in this correspondence, and um, and I think of that network of friends as a sort of imagined Beauvoir community. And here we are in a virtual Beauvoir community. So that's, uh, so that's very, um, that's very moving. And I also want to echo what, um, what Marine said about the extraordinariness of this archive and how much we owe to Sylvie Le Bon de Beauvoir for putting it together and giving it to the, uh, to the, um, to the library. And sorry, I have to do my thank yous. Uh, and all of the successive curators of that collection with whom I've, uh, with whom I've worked, um, starting with Maurice at Berne, um, quite uh, now quite a long time ago. All right. <clears throat> so how I navigated it, it's huge. Right, it's it's twenty thousand letters, and and Marine's given you such a good sense of uh, of what it's like, and that turned into a real methodological uh, challenge. When I first when I first opened the first folder in this uh, archive, um, I was astonished. I was really surprised. I didn't find at all what I was looking for. I thought 
that I would find the insulting letters about the second sex. Uh, I thought I would find abstract discussion of uh, feminist politics. And not at all. What there was was a torrent of passion, admiration, identification, misidentification, disappointment, anger, you know, this whole knot. Of, uh, of emotions. And when I first started to work on it, like many other people, I was, I was thinking about something else. Um, uh, I was actually working on many Grégoire and interested in the history of introspection and, and self-knowledge. And I just uh, looked at the Beauvoir letters in relationship to, uh, to that. And with every, uh, with every visit, it became more clear to me that these letters, this archive, this relationship, was a cultural artifact and a historical phenomenon that deserved attention in its own right. I mean, to be sure, there's still in the, in the book um, a lot of post-war history read through the voices of these, uh, of these readers, but it was really the relationship that was, uh, that was um, and that was so par so powerful. So um, so I was surprised, and and the letters were, they were, funny. They mm -hmm. were thoughtful. They were plain spoken. Um, they were inappropriate. They were ir irreverent. They were sometimes completely off the wall. And all of that makes them just that much more interesting. Um, they're also very theatrical. I was seduced immediately. My first day in the archive, um, I sat down, I think at you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, not very early, but this is Paris. Um, and I didn't move from my desk until six o'clock. I didn't have, I didn't go dance. And this for me is really quite, uh, really quite unusual. Um, so I was completely seduced by these letters who, um, they, they opened with these extraordinary um, sort of calls to the uh, calls to, to Beauvoir. This letter is like a message in a bottle, or here's one saying, writing a letter to uh, a writer is like looking in a strange door. You are approaching, you are hesitating, you are stepping into a new world. Um, and it took me a while to realize that this was about epistolarity, that this is part of what letters do. And so I spent a, chap spent a chapter in the book writing about the epistolary and how you imagine a dialogue and a direct dialogue. And you know, one has to acknowledge that that is illusory in, uh, in many cases, which is why I sometimes talk about the, um, the imagined intimacy of this relationship, which, and I think this is important, is no less powerful for being imagined. Yeah. Um, and then I was also stirred up because emotions are complicated, uh, complicated things, and, uh, and there's a lot going on in this, um, in this, correspondence. Uh, and so I kept having to change my interpretation of the, uh, of the archive. And the book is what I decided I'd finally, uh, what I'd finally settle on. Mm. Yeah, um, it, you said it more than uh, the technical aspect of the archive. It's, um, I, I'm also interested how you navigated into the collection as a historian working on this specific uh, subject of um, intimacy. And uh, uh, I've been reading those letters for almost eight years now, and I realized that it is not um, just a historical uh, research. In my view, it is also an emotional journey. And um, uh, you said that it was a, a big discovery, and I would like to read the first sentence of your book, if you, if you like. Uh, please, thank I, you. I love it because it's very interesting to uh, introduce the, this question of the, the standpoint. You you write, uh, nothing prepared me for the drama I found the first time I opened a folder of reader's letters to Simone de Beauvoir. And um, I think we would all love to hear about this experience. And I think I remember that you have an anecdote about uh, that with a friend of yours. About ah, yeah. so I should tell, the, <laughs> I sh I should tell that story. Um, 
yeah, I still remember writing that sentence. I thought, how in the world am I going to start this book? And then I said, okay, I guess I have to start with how it uh, with how it made me uh, how it made me feel. Um, and I mean, Marine, you write about this as as well. When you immerse yourself in these letters, it is impossible not to be bouleversé by them, right? They, because yeah. of their mode of address, because of the character of the letter, because of the emotions that are uh, being captured, because of the way people write about reading. So, so you get completely drawn into them. And you also do sometimes get drawn into something of a contest between, or, or a tussle between Beauvoir and her readers, in which I find myself understandably pulled in on the readers side, right? So you do come to identify with the readers and, and all the transferential dimensions of uh, their relationship with Bo Beauvoir one takes on. But um, here was, here's the surprising and, and funny story. Uh, I was reading along one day and I came upon a very long handwritten letter from a man who said, uh, I'm, a, I'm a feminist, I've read your uh, work, I've, uh, I've read your memoirs, and my life is unfolding like your memoirs. He thought, you know, that his his life was interesting and like um, Simone de, de, de Beauvoir's. His marriage was falling apart. He was having an affair with a younger woman. The younger woman was having um, affairs with other people. He was jealous. She was jealous. And da 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 da. It went on for ten pages. I thought this is a nervy guy. Um, why does he think that Beauvoir is going to be interested in all of that? And then two things happened. I got to the end, and um, I have three very close friends in uh, in France. He was the father of one of them, um, and I couldn't do anything with that because you're supposed to keep these things anonymous. But I was really startled. And two years later, this friend who knew that I was working on these letters said, "Oh, did you know that my father got a letter from Simone de Beauvoir?" And I said, no. Uh, and she showed me, uh, she showed me it. And that too is confidential and I can't, uh, and I can't share it. But, but Beauvoir was interested, commented in detail on this you know, sort of soap opera of his life, um, brought to bear her, you know, plainly expected him to understand the basic tenets of uh, of existentialism, um, wanted to be sure that he understood that his life was nothing like hers mm -hmm. and that her pact with Sartre was nothing like his, uh, you know, his affair with the, uh, with the younger woman. But, but that was important because I knew, like you, because you can tell from the readers that she did answer, um, but I had never seen this kind of answer to this kind of letter. So it dramatized to me how much she cared and how much this relationship was, as you say, reciprocal. Mm -hmm. And it moved, as I say in the introduction, it moved the, her, that relationship to the center of the, uh, center of the book. Um, so it was quite, that was, that was quite a tumultuous two years. Um, of, uh, of my first work on uh, work on that. And I also just, you know, and just just getting lucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, about that, there's a chapter uh, that I particularly love in your book. And you said to me that this chapter is your favorite too. Uh, it's the one you call the couple troubles, um, mm -hmm. in which you show that those ordinary men and women gave Beauvoir the role of a confident. Uh, in fact, they, like you said, they wrote Beauvoir into their private lives. And uh, how would you place this specific relationship in what we could call, maybe, I don't know if you agree, what we could call a culture of confidence encouraged, encouraged by mass culture, media, um, and uh, psychoanalysis, for example? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a big question, and uh, and that chapter is my favorite because I think there's a you know there's a slightly for those who know Simone de Beauvoir's life very well there's a slightly um, ironic uh, mm -hmm. tone to it. She becomes a sort of marriage counselor 
all of these women and men want to write her in great detail about their marriages and about you know their sexual unhappiness, their emotional uh, emotional difficulties, um, and they actually I, I, I flagged one of these uh, one of these. They make a point of telling her that they're reading her as a couple, that they're sitting in bed together, reading the second sex. Um, and here, for instance, is one, a mother of two from Madrid penned a remarkable letter disclosing just this practice. It's okay if I read it, right? Um, her husband, a typesetter, had encouraged her to read the second sex before their wedding. And both of them now saw Beauvoir as, quote, a symbol of the dignity of the female human being. Um, in this letter, I, this is me, which is short but long on how cramped its author felt by her narrow horizons, Beauvoir becomes a protagonist in the couple's conversation. And here's what the, what the reader says. When I was drowning in the everyday worries of the household and children, and at the same time unhappy about the confines of my world, my husband would say to me, come on, be a little more Simone de Beauvoirienne. <laughs> and uh, she, doesn't, uh, she doesn't say how the husband said that, but you can imagine the husband is saying it, you know, sort of. And, and there are a lot of men, letters from men saying this, you know, I wish my wife would stop complaining and be more like you. Um, anyway, um, so, and, uh, and, and, and people from all over write to her and say, you are a model, uh, you are a model, you are a model of a, of a free, uh, free relationship, of a fulfilling, uh, fulfilling relationship. And the reasons that, you know, the reasons for this culture of confidence, I think, do go beyond, as you were saying, um, Marie, uh, go well beyond just Beauvoir's uh, writing. They, they have to do with the autobiographical um, character of her work, which are not just the memoirs, but the second sex also has a very, uh, also has a very personal, uh, personal mm -hmm. voice. Um, it has to do with this larger, what I call um, cultivation of the intimate public mm -hmm. in the 20th century, which is a term that I borrow from Lauren Berlant and, uh, and use, a, use a great deal. It has to do with the rise of psychoanalysis. And so one of the things I was interested in here is looking at the, um, the relationship between these readers and Beauvoir against the backdrop of the rise of mass culture, um, the courrier du coeur, mm -hmm. and also psychoanalysis. It partakes of all of those uh, of all of those relationships in an interesting way. So sometimes, to be colloquial, sometimes she's cast as an agony aunt. Sometimes she's cast as a psychoanalyst. Sometimes she's cast as a great intellectual. But it's very um, it's very revealing about the whole culture of introspection and confession. And sometimes she's cast as a school teacher, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes these are, these are dutiful daughters writing, uh, writing to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a long thing in there on the, on La Femme Rompue, which, you know, which would probably take too much time to, uh, to explain, but is, uh, is a very interesting case of reading, misreading, misunderstanding of, where feminism meets the female complaint, which are two very different uh, things, and it's one of my uh, it's one of my favorite chapters for for that for that yeah. reason. Yeah, um, and maybe I should have started by uh, the the question I'm about to, to ask you because there's a big mystery in that um, in, in the fact that people write to um, an author. Um, it's, it's about the specificity to, of the relationship between an author and uh, um, her or his readers. And that's a question mm -hmm. that I find fascinating because I, I don't know about you, but I personally never sent or wrote a letter to uh, a writer or a famous person, for example, never. So at the beginning of my research, I spent a, a lot of time, uh, um, too much time, in fact, trying to figure out what, why people would want to write to an author. And uh, what struck me uh, the most at first was that they all thought that they had uh, met 
the, the real Beauvoir through her books. And this confusion um, of, of maybe, yes. maybe not a confusion, but may, may, maybe rather a fusion between the author and the narrator is fascinating. So um, I was wondering what, what do you think about that and how did you solve this big mystery? Because I haven't solved it yet. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, like you, it has never even occurred to me to want to write to an author because I think of a book as its own world that you mm. go in. I don't think of the book as an entry to the author's life, right? Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. That's part of the that's part of the wonder of reading. But it's interesting. Um, I think it was 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 it was it Claudia who said it or, or Jennifer who said not only who looked at Goodreads that was that was you Claudia wasn't it Yeah um, they want to tell her about the experience of reading the experience of reading is so exciting um, and that was one thing I was interested in as a historian um, the vitality of books in what historians consider the, you know, the century of the rise of uh, film and, uh, and radio and visual, visual culture. One of the things these readers testify to is the power of books and, uh, and uh, uh, the sensationalism of, uh, of reading. So like you, it had never occurred to me. I couldn't quite, uh, I couldn't quite uh, figure it out. Um, I think part of the answer is that she really asks them to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you read Beauvoir's work, she calls out to her readers constantly in a way that I hadn't noticed before I started, um, before I started reading. She says, I want you readers to follow me all of the way. I write in order to be loved. I write in order to penetrate uh, the minds of the, um, I mean, she's got a, a fabulous uh, phrase about penetrating the minds of others so that when they hear my voice, they will think they're talking to themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So this sort of melding of self and other, it has to do with her, uh, with her theories of, uh, of literature. So, so she, she elicits this kind of feeling. She really cares. There really is a dialogue. And it took me, I mean, you can see the difference between when that AHR article came out and the, and the book came out. It took me a long time to track this, to really follow this dialogue, uh, follow this dialogue through. But there's a back and forth between her and her readers, even if there aren't any letters um, from her in this archive. And there are, uh, there are a a handful, a uh, handful of them. Yeah. So um, I think the fact that she's a woman makes uh, makes her seem more approachable. Um, I think that this phenomenon may actually be much more common than those of us who don't write to authors mm -hmm. think. Um, there's a wonderful, um, I think she's Belgian uh, novelist, Emily Notombe, who has a fabulous book called Une Forme de Vie. Um, which is an imagined relationship with her readers, uh, with a reader in, in particular. And that, that book is really, really, um, really interesting. And yeah. if, I were, if I were teaching this book, I would have them read Notomba alongside it. So um, I think there's a lot going on in any relationship between a reader and an author, but this particular one at this particular moment, and especially because um, she so crackles with attentiveness to everything that's going on in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Her mantra is, I don't want to miss anything of my time. Um, and I think that also makes readers want to participate in that time with her. They want to be intellectuals. They want to think. They want to be thoughtful. They want to they want to historicize themselves. They want to see themselves, frame themselves in the movements mm -hmm. of history in the 20th mm -hmm. century. And you, you said that she wants to penetrate her readers, and, but she also uses them. Uh, so that's where we can talk of a, a return of influence, of an influence, a, rec a reciprocal influence. I don't know if I'm saying it uh, right. But it raises the question that Jennifer and Crescent just asked in the, the chat box. Uh, she uses those letters 
to um, write her her novels, for example, Les Belles Images or uh, The Woman Destroyed. So how is that feminist? You, says, you say in your book that sometimes she can be very mean to the women who write her. And uh, Crescent also asks about uh, to what extent Beauvoir, was Beauvoir self-conscious about this, about uh, the relationship between the letters and this in psychoanalysis. And I think that the, the two questions can be uh, linked. Um, to what extent is Beauvoir self-conscious about this? Well, both about the about the psycho uh, psychoanalytic dimensions. Um, you know, Beauvoir doesn't have much use for psychoanalysis because she's interested in consciousness, right? And she thinks, I mean, Beauvoir and psychoanalysis is a very complicated topic um, on which many people who are whose names I can see on my screen have written very brilliantly, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to go into it. Um, but, um, and Beauvoir is quite confident that she can manage this dialogue, um, that she's in control as she puts her autobiography out there to the public, right? That she's not afraid to show anything. And one of the things that I try to show rather gently is that she's not as much in control of that as, as she likes. And that putting yourself out there in that way brings all kinds of unanticipated uh, and difficult responses, including that people treat you like um, a courrier du coeur, um, that people, I mean, here, here, for instance, is a reader responding to the penetrate uh, quote that, that, mm -hmm. we, uh, that we just talked about. And this is um, reader saying, saying, you know, you asked me to think about you this way, and this is what has happened, and I'm not in control of it uh, any longer. Um, I would like, this is the reader, and I'm quoting, I would like to retreat behind a dignified reserve but I don't know how to wait. I never knew how. I have participated in so many moments of your life. This book, she's talking about the prime of life, has clarified so many things that have been blurry to me that I'm even more disappointed to be without news from you. I mean, Beauvoir hasn't written her back as much as she mm -hmm. would like to. Mm -hmm. You speak of, quote, penetrating into the lives of others. You have reached this goal and it gives you responsibilities. Speaking for myself, I can no longer consider you a stranger. There, reactions like these are probably unpleasant and you had not envisioned them, but I do not feel responsible. Right? So this, you know, this relationship has, has, gotten, um, has gotten sort of um, out of control in a very, mm -hmm. uh, in a very interesting, interesting way. I don't think it's exactly psychoanalytic. I think... Um, you know, psycho psychoanalysis is, is um, one of the disciplines in the 60s. It is really the discipline for thinking about sexual, uh, sexual difference, um, the character of masculine and feminine. So, so it's not surprising that this relationship is, is packed with uh, psychoanalytic uh, imagery. Um, and um, this, is, this is Jennifer's question. Do I think this particularly feminist? No, in a word, um, I don't think it's anti, I don't think it's, uh, I think, I mean, what I try to do there is see this relationship between Beauvoir and her readers as a micropolitics of a kind of feminism with everything that is difficult and unmastered, all of the solidarity and all of the antagonism that that can entail. I mean, I do think it gives us a um, a nice charged version of a feminist relationship, but it's not all sisterliness and happiness. Um, very far, very far from that. But I think that's true of I think that's true of feminism as well, and that's one of the reasons why feminism is so volatile and has such a um, and has such a volatile history. I mean, I think it's true of all political movements, um, but the one that I'm interested in here is uh, is is feminism. 
maybe we could say that it's a feminist practice in the sense that she encouraged people and women to write her and she responded to them and she kept saying them to um to keep her in in touch to to keep her informed of what they were doing mm -hmm. and uh, maybe there are two aspects um about this uh, maybe she helped them out of an interest for human life or human experience but yes. also for yes. solidarity i think the word um, yes the collect this collection makes me think of this word of this notion of solidarity if um i don't know if I, I tend to analyze this uh, like a feminist practice, but it's a uh, yes, it's a double personality. <laughs> yeah, and even and and even when, um, as in La Femme Rompue, and I think I think it's interesting that you and I have uh, slightly different readings of <laughs> of, of this. And, and gee, I wish we could have a seminar and read both and and see uh, see what it's about. Even when I think and and you know, there is certainly, you know, all kinds of transference uh, going on. Mm -hmm. I think that she is caricaturing her readers. Yeah, of course. And mm -hmm. she has created a character based on letters, letters that she's gotten, who isn't very sympathetic, who's, who's clueless. And she says, my readers didn't understand me. They don't understand me. They're as clueless as my heroine. But the readers love it anyway and they love her mm. anyway so it doesn't matter if she's not um you know warm and sisterly in the ways that we might expect even when she's being didactic even when she's being aloof um they love her and that says something about the power of her persona the charisma of her ideas um and about reading and how people read books the way they want to read them um, I also think it says something about uh, something about feminism, right? And the mm -hmm. and the different kinds of even when one's coming from very very different uh, subject positions, even when you have very different ideas about roots out of ways out of of certain uh, certain dilemmas, there can be solidarity, support, and if not actual understanding, at least solidarity, enough solidarity to give us, to mm -hmm. give us that understanding. I think that's important as, you know, as feminism, um, you know, as feminism is pushed in very, very different directions in the 21st, uh, 21st century, I think it's important to, to recognize the very, very different ways of living one's feminism and one's condition as, you know, as a, mm -hmm. as a woman. Right, I think that's one of the things that comes that comes out of that. About Beauvoir feminism, uh, we know that she supported the feminist movement um, during the the seventies. We have testimonials by the activists, activists, but um, I, I'm sure people are curious to learn uh, more about we, what we can learn from those letters written by ordinary women. What they can, what what they tell us about. Um, about how the feminist movement in the 70s in France were, was yeah. received. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, that was really a, a fun part to do. And I wanted, and, and that's a part on which lots of people have written things. So, um, you know, Sylvie Chaperon has, has written not just the book, but many books, uh, many books on that. So I had to struggle to figure out what, you know, what I could, uh, what I could bring to the table. And, um, and I think what you get from these letters are the affective or the emotional dimensions of feminism, the sort of affective exhilaration of solidarity, um, the rage when that solidarity feels like it's uh, it's been um, betrayed. Um, there are in this book, I should warn people, many angry pages where I think my anger um, echoes the readers on a regime which criminalizes contraception and abortion. And I give those letters a lot of play and the and and the fury 
at what women are asked to do with their bodies, the fury, the, the dark side, if you will, of the Trente Glorieuse, mm -hmm. right? Which we think of as, oh, the baby boom. Well, you know, the flip side of the baby boom is a lot of people getting pregnant and not wanting to be. And then having to go to Switzerland, go to England, um, you know, go have um, back alley uh, abortions. And, um, and the ways in which abortion politics becomes, you know, in, um, in sort of, through the through the mid 60s down into the early 70s the issue that brings together women of different classes from different regions um, it's not it's also not just a women's movement and it's not just a heterosexual women's movement the way in which uh, the way in which the legalization of uh, of abortion is an issue that can bring um, that brings lesbians into the movement even those who uh, who aren't out. Um, that was really surprising to me. I think it it may be hard for us to imagine that, at least in the United States this day, these days, when abortion you know politics mm -hmm. have become so divisive and and contested. Um, and all right, so I was interested in that. I think is part of the uh, is part of the um, explosion of feminism after uh, after 1968. 1968, I also argue, sort of metabolizes, uh, changes the metabolism of the left and brings a flourishing of all different kinds of, uh, all kinds of groups. And it radicalizes a great many women who go along with 68 and then is a kind of backlash against the sexism and misogyny of much of the women's movement, um, um, of much of the student movement in 68. So, um, I think that comes through in that uh, in that last chapter, but what you get from the letters is this extraordinary sense of self transformation, self discovery, um, and you know I don't think that that Beauvoir necessarily brings them there. I think that th this movement um, wins Beauvoir over, right? Because they're not patient. It's not the kind of feminism that she encountered in the 1940s mm -hmm. or the or the 1950s. Um, it's a much more radical, impatient young. And 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 Beauvoir's amb ambivalence about uh, about feminism is famous, and I think very very interesting. And so part of the story is how she is brought to become less ambivalent and to embrace wholeheartedly, uh, wholeheartedly this, uh, this movement. And in some ways she was ahead of it, in some ways uh, she wasn't. So, so it brings, shows, the, shows the different components of, uh, of feminism. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like, I, we have, I think, um, a little less than 10, ten minutes left. And I, I'd like oh. to ask before my, my last question, I, I'd like to ask Meryl a question because it, it's very interesting and it's related to the letters. Um, Meryl writes, I'm wondering whether either of you see a difference between these interactions with interlocutors from France versus from the US and other countries. Because yes, of course, but we received a lot of letters from around the world. It's uh, um, and there is a such, she writes, Meryl, there's a such long history of transatlantic misunderstandings, in part due to the partially translation, but also revealing about two different political cultures. I don't know if you have listed the, um, the, the nationality, the origin of the, the readers, but I think it's much more from, from France. That there are more letters from France? Yes, I think so. Um, there, there are, and you know, and that, and that, I've, I've, sort of turned that territory over to Marine, who's able to, you know, I started working on this archive when there were very few letters in it, so it was really mm. impossible for me to ever get my arms around the whole thing and do the kind of statistical. Um, Reckoning that that Marine has has done so well, um, 
are there there are differences i suppose from the i mean the american letters are much actually quicker to recognize this as her as a as a feminist and not just as a um celebrity intellectual um she's less of a mass culture phenomenon i don't know maureen what do you what what do you think i mean one of the one of the things that was fun was to see uh letters from um american feminists whose names i know well in uh in this uh in this archive that was that was fun yeah <laughs> um, and i won't say who you are but you know you probably uh, you probably you mm -hmm. probably know and those are much more i mean those are the appropriate those are the letters that that i sort of would have expected that engage the issues that i i know they aren't um gee would you read my horoscope and tell me what the future holds in store those are the letters from france or from belgium uh, but there are a lot of letters too from um from brazil I mean, you can see the sort of you can see the wake yeah. of her of her travels, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. She's gone somewhere, and then she and then she gets uh, she gets followers, and they and they write her. So yeah, I think the explanation is uh, from the sixties. She traveled a lot, and uh, Tiffany Martin is here. Uh, she is the specialist of Beauvoir ah. travels. Yes, if she wants right. to write something in the chat box, but uh, yes, of course, I. I did some statistics, yes, uh, but uh, it was more to to know if women were were more um, much more in the in the in the archive than men, and they are they are, they are they the are. majority. But uh, um, but I, I realized that uh, the letters from people from all over the world uh, only begin to arrive. Uh, from the 60s, so when she began to uh, publish her memoirs, and they are very quickly translated into other languages, and uh, mm -hmm. when she traveled a lot in the 60s, during the 60s in Brazil, Cuba, etc. Right. Uh, but I, right. I, yeah. But I think it's um, Meryl. It's a wonderful subject. Uh, it, it would need a, a M much more time and maybe a, um, a, a study, a complete study, because yes, it's um, there's a lot to do. Um, can we? I, I don't know if we, Gina, can can I ask another question? Because I, I love that question. <laughs> I want to hear. Sure. Yeah. Okay. It's it's about your Judith, your contribution to political history like we we have ah. talked about this and also your contribution to your history of emotions uh, because you study shame during the algerian war right. and maybe it would right. interest uh people to learn what you can learn from the letters about this and how it um allows a political uh, history from again from below right or from inside, or from inside, right? or, yes. um, mm -hmm. or or an emotional history of politics. Yeah, yeah historians are 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 interested these days in in what we call the emotional turn, um, which is both understanding the emotional underpinnings of politics and also the history of different emotions and how we've uh, how we've thought about them, and that was. Um, there, there are two chapters on the Algerian War, actually, because these issues are uh, are very um, complicated and uh, and interesting. Um, as I was, and 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 we don't usually think of Beauvoir and the and the Algerian War. We think of her as a bystander. We tend to think of other characters as more as more central. But as one uh, one reads her and one reads the Foxy shows, it's clear just how important um, the Algerian uh, the Algerian War is uh, is to her and to the uh, and to the life of the Republic. And it's very difficult for her readers because they go from reading Memoir du Jeune Fille Ranché and uh, La Force de l'Age, which are kind of uplifting and dramatic, and then they go into the Fox des Shows, which is so difficult and so uh, upsetting and so soaked 
in shame, I think, as I, uh, as I call it. And then, and, and, and finally, I realized, I think this is actually important, that it, that that volume of her memoirs is kind of a phenomenology of emotion, a phenomenology of shame. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, and it's something that her readers grab onto and share very quickly. Um, and that's one of, I mean, that's a kind of low point in the relationship with Bovar and her readers because sharing shame is not a pleasant experience. No. Um, it's not an uplifting experience. It induces a kind of paralysis and self-laceration. And there's another part of it that's complicated, which is that Beauvoir, in writing about shame, is also involved, it took me a while to figure this out, in a dialogue with Sartre, who writes about shame, and Franz Fanon, who writes about mm -hmm. shame. And, um, and Fanon and Sartre say, shame is a revolutionary emotion. You know, and if you're raised in the latter part of the 20th century, the 21st century, you're going, what, what is this revolutionary emotion? So I had to, uh, so I had to sort that out. But I think the point is um, that emotion is not just a matter of intimate life or personal life or, you know, kind of sexuality and, and conjugality. It is a powerful present force in politics. I mean, any American sadly knows that. Uh, these days. And so I tried to bring it into both the history of the Algerian War and I think, as I said, into the history of, uh, of feminism to try to get at the affective dimensions of the, uh, of the Algerian War. And there's all this, also all of this complicated um, discussion of, of torture, the difficulty of writing about torture, the reactions to reading about uh, about uh, about torture. Um, mm -hmm. So there's some um, for those who are interested in Algeria. There are two uh, there are two quite long chapters in there about. Right. Thank you, Judy. Um, Gina, maybe Marella wants to comment. All right. Thank you, Judy and Marine. So that's a good chunk of input from your book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for um, your discussion. So we'll, we'll listen to the contribution of um, the commentator for today's uh, discussion. Uh, let me give a brief introduction about our commentator. She finished her PhD uh, from the University of Santo Tomas, Manila in 2016. She is an associate professor at the University of Santo Tomas. And uh, she is a member of the International Council of Philosophy in Philosophical Inquiry with Children, Federation of Australian, um, Australasian Philosophy in Schools Association and the Philosophical Association of the Philippines. She has presented and published papers on feminism, particularly about the works of Simone de Beauvoir and Iris Marion Young, Philosophy of Education, Philosophy for Children, and Philosophy of Childhood. Let us welcome Dr. Marella Ada Bolanias of the University of Santo Tomas. Hi, Marella. Yeah, thank you, Gina. Um, good day. So I was tasked to give a commentary on what was presented today. So first, I wish to thank our speakers, Dr. Judith Coffin, Marine Rouge, Dr. Jennifer McQueen, Dr. Claudia Boyatz, for sharing with us their wonderful research projects. So the presentations may be considered already as a reaffirmation that Bouvois' thoughts remain relevant to this day. For a time, researches, at least from where Gina and I are from, from the Philippines, were limited only to Bouvoir's um, memoirs, philosophical essays, novels, and her correspondences with, with Sart. So with the transition of the Simone de Beauvoir studies to the online platform and the commencement of Dr. Coffins and Marine Rouge's project, researchers were now introduced to a level of familiarity 
not just of the Vos text, but of the Vos sense of humanity as well. The letters received and answered by Beauvoir proves how she has come into full circle from her writing, her essays, and seeing how her essays are changing um, women, women's lives during that time. So Dr. Coffin notes um, that Beauvoir's readers sent her letters with various or varying concerns. Others wrote about being enlightened by Beauvoir's books. Others spoke of their frustrations, their desires, and their affairs. Others speak of their admiration, while others speak of their det detestation of Beauvoir's, Beauvoir and her work. Um, from her, um, from um, Judith's paper published in 2010, she writes, the letters offer a case study in reading, writing, and relationship of both self-reflection. They capture a turning point in the history of sexual discourse and feeling, above all, they sketch a partial but unusually intimate portrait of the 1950s. In an age when women cannot speak of and for themselves, they find solace and comfort in Vuvo's writings. They saw in her an ally who is so willing to speak and fight for their lot. The compilation of all these letters show us how Vuvo helped shape women's perception of themselves during the 50s to the 70s. Their project widens our understanding of Beauvoir's work. It opens up the field for more studies on the actual implication of Beauvoir's text to the lives of women who encountered them. And so I raise the question, with all that is said, we might ask, how will these letters change the way we understood Beauvoir? And to close, just so when we thought we have already exhausted themes from Beauvoir's works, Studies like the ones presented by Judith and Marine and the availability and the accessibility of the articles published in the Simone de Beauvoir studies, it makes one want to read and reread Beauvoir one more time and to try to reappropriate her works with our present circumstances. To quote Jennifer McQueen from the introduction of the 2019 um, publication, to bring Beauvoir into dialogue is also to raise the question of women's freedom then and now and to drive towards its reality, toward the future of continuing conversation. So thank you very much to that. That ends the um, very brief commentary on what has transpired tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Marilla. So indeed, um, just as what Claudia says, said earlier, Beauvoir is the voice that needs to be heard more and more. Thank you very much. It has been a fruitful discussion. Um, we, can we accommodate um, a few questions from the participants, please? Anyone from the speakers, uh, commentators, and guests may respond. So we have a question from um, Rodrigo Abenes from the Philippines. It has been said that we are now in the Renaissance in Beauvoir. Can you give us an idea how did how did scholars periodized periodized the studies in the Beauvoir, and what are the dominant themes of the studies in these different periods? Ooh, I think one of the the actual Beauvoir scholars should should. Uh, should take that. Um, you, all of the literature that's written about her, that's a huge, uh, that's, a, that's a huge uh, topic. Mm -hmm. and, and I get to bail and say, I'm just a, uh, I'm just a historian. Um, so the, the kind of, I mean, I think, I think to, to return to, um, to what Maria asked, you know, sort of how do we see Beauvoir differently after this? I mean, I think, part of the Renaissance is returning to her as a writer, right? And, and somebody who is very self-conscious about the way she writes and the way she thinks that people read. Mm -hmm. And another theme in the present, I think, is looking at her as a, as a phenomenologist and, and seeing her memoirs, her, her autobiography, not as a diversion from the second sex, but as very much part of that same project. I think the <clears throat> the sort of theoretical ambitions of the 
of the memoirs are uh, are very interesting to me, and I hadn't appreciated them before I read them alongside all of these uh, alongside all of these readers. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judy. Um, yeah, that 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 means there's so much aspects in Beauvoir's works that we have to explore even further. So we're only talking about uh, for today. Um, maybe I must, if if I, if I could say, an iota of the entire entire legacy of Beauvoir. So uh, I think. Uh, we'd be interested to listen to these uh, topics for the next sessions. Um, there's a question from Bruna Mel Mello from Brazil. Uh, let me read the, I don't know if this is a question, but he, Bruna said, thinking about the Renaissance in Beauvoir, I said, I would like to hear you talk about the influence of partially translation of the second sex to the misunderstanding of Beauvoir, feminist thinking. I'm now studying the influence of Marx in Beauvoir and I'm dealing with this problem of partially translation. Thankfully, in Brazil, we have a wonderful translation of second sex. But as we have so as but as we have so few works on Beauvoir, we have to collect US materials, and some of them are based on a reading of partially translation. Your thoughts, uh, Judy. Well, Constance Board is here, isn't she? Or at least she was yeah, earlier. Anna, we don't Anna have to. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. don't have to rely on partially translation mm -hmm. anymore. Um, um, you know, we have we have Bruna. we have hers. Um, so well, I should. Bruna I suppose... and I have been. Bruna and I have been privately writing to each other um, on on the on the chat box. We have have so much to say about that and I told her we could get stay in touch but I'm having a very interesting conversation with her and <laughs> hoping that she does not have to rely on partially translation any longer. <laughs> and tra translation matters it boils down to it that does. and it's a shame that for so long we had to rely on mm -hmm. partially translation it was hard but happy days are here again <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's there's probably a third wave. I mean, in, in in my book, I have there's a sort of first set of readings of the. I mean, the second sex is a big book, and there's so much to ricochet mm -hmm. off of, so that people yeah. respond to it very differently. There's one set of readings in the um, late 40s and 50s, another in the 60s, and then there will be another Constance after uh, after your translation is really uh, is really digested. Um, you know, I guess I guess partially translation is cheap and still available. So if people just go online and say, "Oh, I need to get the second sex," they uh, they pull that uh, they pull that down. It could happen. Um, I will say I have the. Uh, what I wish. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. What I wish is that Simone de Beauvoir could have been alive to see the intersectionality that has developed in the feminist movement. Now, that's a topic for a whole other <laughs> right. seminar. But um, because I think, as you said previously, she really did get interested in the feminist movement when she realized it was a humanist movement. It was a movement right. that affected so many other issues mm -hmm. um, right. of humanity. And it would be wonderful to hear today what she... Um, what she thinks. And the more I become involved in feminism and the intersectionality that that, that involves, the more I'm admirative of her uh, and the way she was able to write the second sex, because that is what it's about. It's about a confluence of ideas, about a confluence of problems, mm -hmm. not only just women. That's I think that's why she kept denying that she was a feminist in the beginning is she didn't want to be boxed into only defending one issue. Now today, feminism covers a whole array of issues. Anyhow, another moment. <laughs> and Br Bruna, you, you might, about the translation, you might want to get in touch with um, Anna Bougie, who's just sent a message in the chat box, and she's also a specialist of, the, of this topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a way in which the Simon, the um, 
the international society might do more to advertise yeah. the, mm -hmm. the newer translation. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think to be honest, one of the ways that things get taught, I mean, being realistic, what usually gets taught is the introduction. So I think, you know, kind of making sure that there's a way to, you know, be able to, to use the introduction and have people read uh, Sheila and, uh, and, and Connie's, um, that would be important. That would make, uh, that would make difference. Oh, okay. Sheila is on a train, so she's not really here. <laughs> Or she is here, but sort of here. Anyway. And she can probably hear, but she probably ah. can't really respond. Ah okay. ah, okay. Hi, Sheila. Anyway, um, you know, translating, uh, translating Beauvoir is, is, is no joke. Right? I struggled translating these letters, you know, to kind of get an idiomatic sense of these letters, their different voices in the 50s and uh, in the 50s and, and 60s. Not give, uh, not give away their identity. That was, um, I, I really have a, a lot of respect for, uh, for what you two did, Connie and Sheila. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we, tr we tried not to try other... here. We tried to translate. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see, then there's a, there's a question in the chat about how did we select the letters? Oh, Oof. Oof. And oh, la, 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 la. yeah, for me it was so hard. I don't know how you did it, Judith, but uh, the the collection is still being organized. Uh, I think Guillaume Delaunay is here, so you you can speak up, Guillaume, if you'd like. But uh, they're not just letters from readers, so uh, they are also letters from institutions. And uh, oui, yeah, Guillaume is here. Yeah, Guillaume, I'm interested to hear mm -hmm. how the collection is going, how, what new principles of organization you're using. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. So uh, for now, we respect uh, the chronological um, uh, way to organize a collection. So we don't have any made any change in the current uh, organization and I'm currently describing each of the letters and oh. uh, indicating the name and uh, the date etc and uh, we are still at um, 1865 so it has to be continued but it's a huge work as you said to well, hundreds of letters, so mm -hmm. it may take some some years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you are a researcher taking on the whole archive, it's hard to go with um, a methodology. Mm, it's uh, it's uh, for me it was impossible to to. Um, you cannot, for example, take a, say you can you have to you will take a sample of letters because it, they are uh, mix of letters from institutions and uh, intellectuals, for example. So you have to read the whole archive. So it takes time because it's, as we, we already said it, it's 20,000 letters. I know, and at, at some point I was getting, because because of course I could only work on it when I would go over to France in the, yes, in the and you kind summer of and, interest. you know, mm -hmm. and I have a life and I have kids and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and right, and you can't take, and you can't take pictures. Yeah. And every time I went, they were categorized differently. So it's <laughs> recent. And thank you, Guillaume, for doing yes, this. Thank it's, you. you know, it's new that it's chronological. It used to be almost entirely random. So I, um, I just felt like I needed to read everything. And at one point I said to a friend who's a very wonderful historian at the University of Chicago, do you have to, do you think I have to read all of these letters? And she looked at me and she said, Judy, when I say something about a subject, I want to know that I've at least put my hand on every relevant document. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay you know, deep breath back to it. Um, so I can say that I put my hand on at least up until 1972. I mean, that's why I decided I had to stop at, uh, at some point. But 
the, the methodology is tricky. What is this archive about, right? Is it about Beauvoir? Is it about ordinary life? Is it about reading? Is it about a relationship? I decided it was about a relationship and that what, and that's what um, my book, of, uh, book is about, a, a relationship that is revealing about history and also shaped by the history of the, of the period. But there are a gazillion different ways that it could be uh, that it could be approached. Of course. Mm -hmm. And those chairs are so uncomfortable. <laughs> and the table is a little too high, so you always get a crick in your neck. Yeah. <laughs> I was so as long as I have Guillaume there, I'm talking about the <laughs> conditions du travail. <laughs> C'est un message. Il y a quelque chose à peur. <laughs> uh, it's funny. It's really <laughs> wonderful. Um, it's yeah. also fun that, that you can sometimes go, um, every now and then I would get up um, and go across to the um, computers that are on the other side of the room and look up one of these correspondents. And then I would see, um, oh, Wow, I could go talk to this person, but I never ever wanted oh, to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. I tried to avoid that at all costs. And and Marine, I think you're doing that, and I think that's going to be its own fabulous. Yeah, I decided to book. track down the correspondence. Yes, but um, yeah. but yeah. but I respect the, the their privacy, of course. Uh, but I met very interesting and touching women. Uh, so it has been a very yeah human experience and uh yeah it's uh and it's hard sometimes because some of those women have uh, have had very difficult life and it's often the yes the reason why they wrote Simone de Beauvoir in the first place right so, right yeah it's hard to welcome their 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 words uh, because as historians we're, we're trained to work on papers right and uh, we're, we're not trained to yeah to collect the people's words so yes uh, so yes this this approach of mine is um, uh, it, it led me to 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 give a very large place to personal trajectories of those women but also mine because uh, like like we said earlier it's an emotional journey and we we are in it so yeah yeah, and these these readers. Can I just read? A, you know, here's another reader. Just because I love them so so much, and to give you give you all a sense of what the book is about. Here is a here is a reader, um, and I talk about it in a passage where I'm saying, you know, do these? How do we think of these readers as passive, as active, or somehow none of those words will work? Um, and she describes herself. She says, "I am more a receiver than a giver." But then she says, quote, I read, I think, I listen a great deal, but I do not create. She's very modest. I'm very sensitive, a sort of instrument played by the world. I vibrate, I choose, and reproduce the sounds that I love. I accept the ideas and the impressions that suit and that seem strong. I mean, that's such a wonderful um, way of, of capturing reading and and the sort of irrelevance of questions about whether people are active or passive. I mean, they're both at the same, uh, they're both at the same time. And, and one of the reasons I love, uh, I love this archive is that it upends so many notions of um, what Beauvoir's feminism is, uh, is shaped out of, what its effects are, where it comes from, readers and their agency all of uh, you know all of that i think it's very helpful for uh for doing those things mm -hmm. but other questions do we have other questions yeah i think maybe just one last oh. com a comment on related to the letters um let me go back to that question he asked something about uh, whether you found any in, in the letters um related to ambiguity not sure if i got that question right but, hmm. well i think i know the I, I i think i know what you're talking about and i didn't come across any that are specifically about her notion of ambiguity there is a great deal about ambiguity in there but not 
but not specific. There, there is relatively little, I'm gonna say this cautiously because of course I'm not sure. There is relatively little discussion of specific mm -hmm. concepts like, uh, like ambiguity and much more about how can we particularize these ideas? How can I make them work in my life? How can I live them? How do they speak to my dilemmas? I think, I don't know, what do you think, Marine? Yes, I, 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 I agree with you. But, and in the end, I think ambiguity is everywhere. In the, yeah. the, in the, it's the ambiguity of life, in the, it's the ambiguity of women's condition. And uh, so, yes, I agree with you. There's no specific discussion about the concept mm. of Beauvoir, but uh, ambiguity, I think, is everywhere. Okay, on that note, thank you very much. That concludes our discussion. And thank you once again to our guests, to our scholars, to the other uh, guests who are here. Thank you very much. And to, of course, to our participants. So we would like to give a few announcements before we part ways. So um, allow me to just share a few announcements. Um, collaboration with the International Simone de Beauvoir Society is on deck. So this will lead us to the next sessions of um, webinar uh, in partnership with the Department of Philosophy of UST and of course the Society and hopefully the International uh, Simone de Beauvoir Journal Studies as well. Call for contributions for the collaborative research blog of Marine, or if you want, if you're interested, all, mm -hmm. interested also take part of our webinar. You may send us a message uh, through our email address, Beauvoir Series at gmail.com. And you can get a discount uh, through this code, a discount of, of, of the book of uh, Dr. Judith Coffin. So you can use this code to get a 30% discount. For those interested to receive an e-certificate, uh, please fill out the evaluation form. I will send the link in a little while. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Marie. Thank, thank you, Claudia. Judy. Thank yes. you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer, Claudia, you know. everyone, and everyone who attended. Thank you, Maria. Right. Thank you to the whole so, audience. <laughs> Keep in touch. And uh, now to conclude, let's now, um, we, I invite you everyone to um, join in the singing of the University of Santa Tomas hymn. Oh, okay. Merci beaucoup. Maraming salamat. Thank you from the Philippines.